Ted wrote me in October 1975 that he felt as if he were in the eye of a hurricane, and indeed he had been in the center of some manner of storm ever since his arrest in August. I hadn't known of this arrest until he phoned me at the end of September, and he had passed it off with a shrug to me just as he had with Meg and his other Washington friends. It would be a long time before I learned of the investigation that went on throughout the entire autumn. Once in a great while in the years ahead, a detective would let something slip, and then say hastily, Forget I said that. I didn't forget, but I didn't tell anyone what I'd heard, and I most assuredly didn't write anything about it. Occasionally odd bits and pieces would leak to the press, but the entire story would never be known to me until after the Miami trial four years hence. As it was, having only fragments of the story, I tried to withhold judgment. Had Ted been a complete stranger to me, as all the other suspects I'd written about had been, resolutions of my feelings might have come sooner. I don't believe it was because I was dense. Better minds than mine continued to support him. In each case that I researched after the Ted murders, each young woman's murder where a suspect was arrested, I traced back to see where that man had been on the days of the crime where Ted was a suspect, and for the Ted crimes, the men had solid alibis. By the fall of 1975, there were more than a dozen detectives in Washington, Utah, and Colorado working full-time on Ted Bundy. Captain Pete Hayward and Detective Jerry Thompson from the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office, Detective Mike Fisher from the Pitkin County District Attorney's Office in Aspen, Colorado, Detective Sergeant Bill Baldridge from the Pitkin County Sheriff's Office, Detective Milo Vig from the Mesa County Sheriff's Office in Grand Junction, Colorado, Detective Lieutenant Ron Ballantane, and Detective Ira Beal from the Bountiful Utah Police Department, Captain Nick Mackey and Detectives Bob Keppel, Roger Dunn, and Kathy McChesney from the King County, Washington Sheriff's Office, Detective Sergeant Ivan Beeson, and Detectives Ted Faunus and Wayne Dorman from the Seattle Police Homicide Unit. Ted had stated to Jerry Thompson and John Bernardo that he had never been to Colorado, had explained away the maps and brochures of the ski areas by saying, Somebody must have left them in my apartment. Mike Fisher, in checking Bundy's credit card slips, found that that was not true. Moreover, he was able to place Bundy's car, the VW Bug, bearing two separate sets of plates, in Colorado on the very days that the victims in the state had vanished, and within a few miles of the sites of the disappearances. The Chevron Oil Company duplicate records noted that Ted had purchased gas as follows. On January 12, 1975, the day Karen Campbell disappeared from the Wildwood Inn in Glenwood Springs, Colorado on March 15, 1975, the day Julie Cunningham walked away from her apartment forever, in Golden, Dillon, and Silverthorne, Colorado on April 4, 1975, in Golden, Colorado on April 5th in Silverthorne, and on April 6th, the day Denise Oliverson vanished in Grand Junction, Colorado. But only once had Ted ever been seen, and that was in Lake Sammamish State Park on July 14, 1974. The King County detectives began to chart as much of Ted Bundy's life as they could ferret out. That was why his law school records had been subpoenaed. Because their probe into Ted had been carried out with a minimum of fanfare, Detective Kathy McChesney had been very startled when I had called her at Ted's behest. The investigators had not known that Ted was even aware that he was under suspicion in Washington. At the same time that Ted's Utah Law School records were subpoenaed, his telephone records were requested from Mountain Bell in Salt Lake City, records going back to September 1974 when he first moved to Utah. Kathy McChesney asked if I would come in for an interview in early November 1975. She had been given the assignment of interviewing the women Ted had known in Seattle, however peripherally. Again, I repeated, this time for the record, the circumstances under which I had met Ted, our work at the crisis clinic, our close but sporadic friendship over the intervening years. Why do you think he called you just before his arrest in Salt Lake City? She asked. I think it was because he knew that I worked with you all the time, and I don't think he wanted to talk to detectives directly. Kathy thumbed through a stack of papers 
pulling one out and said suddenly, "'What did Ted say to you when he called you on November 20th, 1974?' I looked at her blankly. When? Last year, on November 20th. Ted didn't call me, I answered truthfully. I hadn't talked to Ted since sometime in 1973. Yes, we have his telephone records. There's a call to your number a little before midnight on Wednesday, November 20th. What did he say? I had known Kathy McChesney since we had both been in the King County Police Basic Homicide School in 1971. She as a deputy sheriff and myself as an invited auditor. She had been promoted to detective, although she looked more like a high school girl, and she was sharp. I'd interviewed her countless times when she worked in the sex crimes unit. I wasn't trying to evade her question, but I was puzzled. It's difficult to remember what you were doing on a particular date a whole year before and then it dawned on me. Kathy, I wasn't home that night. I was in the hospital before I had an operation the day before. But my mother told me about a funny call. It was a call from a man who wouldn't leave his name. And yeah, it, it was on November 20th. That mystery was solved. But I have often wondered since if the events to follow might have somewhat been different if I had been home to take that call. In the years ahead, I would receive dozens of phone calls from Ted. Calls from Utah, Colorado, Florida, as well as scores of letters, and we would have several face-to-face -face meetings. I would be caught up in his life again, torn between belief in him completely and the doubts that grew stronger and stronger. Kathy McChesney believed me. I'd never lied to her, and I never would. If I'd known who the man was who'd called me, I would have told her. Ted also made two other calls on the night of November 20th. Two calls between 11 and midnight. Although he had broken his secret engagement to Stephanie Brooks in January of that year, sent her away without any apologies or explanations, he had placed a call to her parents' home in California at 11.03 p.m. Stephanie hadn't been there. A woman friend of the family recalls that she had talked to a friendly-sounding man who asked for Stephanie. I told him that Stephanie was engaged and living in San Francisco. And he hung up. Ted had next dialed an Oakland residence where none of the occupants had ever heard of Ted Bundy or Stephanie Brooks. The couple who lived there had no contacts in Seattle, Utah, and the man who answered figured it had been a wrong number. By the time Ted reached my number in Seattle, he'd been very upset, according to my mother. In wondering whom that call might have been from, Ted's name had never entered my mind. Now, as Kathy asked me about it, I knew that the timing of the midnight call might be imperative. Ted had called me 12 days after Carol DeRanche had escaped her kidnapper and after Debbie Kent had vanished, 20 days after Laura Amy disappeared, a month after someone spirited Melissa Smith away. I wish I had been home that night, I told Kathy. So do I. Kathy's assignments took her to the Elder Bundy's residence in Tacoma. They believed none of the charges against their son. There would be no permission to search their home or the area around their cabin on Crescent Lake. What was unthinkable would not be helped along by the Bundys, and there was no probable cause to obtain search warrants. Frida Rogers, Ted Bundy's landlady for five years, was also fiercely protective of him. From the day he had located his room at 4143 12th NE by knocking on doors, Frida had liked him. He had been a good tenant, more like a son than a rumor, often putting himself out to help them. His room in the southwest corner of the old house had rarely been locked, and it was cleaned every Friday by Frida herself. Surely, if he had something to hide, she reasoned, she would have sensed it. His things are all gone. He moved everything out in September of 1974. Look around, if you like, but you won't find anything. Detectives Roger Dunn and Bob Keppel checked the Rogers' house from top to bottom, even climbing up into the attic. If anything had been hiding up there, the insulation would have been disturbed, and it had not been. They moved over the grounds with metal detectors, looked for spots where something might have been buried, clothes, jewelry, parts of a bicycle. There was nothing. 
Kathy McChesney talked with Meg Anders. Meg produced checks that Ted had written in 1974. They were not incriminating in the least, simply small checks written for groceries. Meg's own checks helped her to isolate what she had done on particularly important days and determine whether she had seen her fiancé on those days. Asked about the plaster of Paris she had seen in Ted's room, Meg said she had seen it first a long time ago, perhaps in 1970. But I saw a hatchet under the front seat of his car, a hatchet with a pinkish leather cover in the summer of 1974, and the crutches. I saw them in May or June of 1974. He said they belonged to Ernest Rogers. We'd been to Green Lake one day. I asked him about the hatchet because it bothered me. I can't remember what his explanation was, but I think it made sense at the time. It was in August of 1974. I'd just come back from a trip to Utah. He was talking about getting a rifle that day. The cleaver and the meat tenderizer. I saw those when he was packing. And the oriental knife. He said someone gave him the knife as a present. Can you think of anything else that bothered you? McChesney asked. Well, it, it didn't then, but he always kept two pairs of mechanics overalls and a two-box in a chunk of his car. Did Ted have any friends at Evergreen College in Olympia? Just Rex Stark, the man he worked with on the Crime Commission. Rex was on the campus in 1973 and 1974, and Ted stayed some nights with him when he worked in Olympia. Rex had a place on the lake there. Did he have any friends in Ellensburg? Jim Paulus. He knew him from high school, and his wife. We visited them once. Meg knew of no one Ted might know at Oregon State University. No, there had never been any pornography in his room. No, he didn't own a sailboat, but he had rented one once. Ted often liked to search out lonely country roads when they went on drives. Did he ever go to the taverns alone? Only O'Banions and Dante's. Meg consulted her diary. There were so many dates to remember. Ted called me from Salt Lake City on October 18th last year three times. He was going hunting with my father the next morning. He called me on November 8th after 11. Salt Lake City time zone would make it after midnight there. There was a lot of noise in the background when he called. Melissa Smith vanished on October 18th. On November 8th, Carol DeRanche was abducted at 7.30, and Debbie Kent vanished forever at 10.30. Recalling July 1974, Meg remembered that Ted had gone to Lake Sammamish State Park on July 7th, the week before Denise and Janice disappeared. He told me he was invited to a water skiing party. When he came over later, he said he hadn't had a very good time. In fact, there had been no party, although the King County detectives learned later that two couples who knew Ted from Republican Party functions had been at Lake Sammamish water skiing, and they'd see Ted walking along the beach alone. We were surprised to see him there because he was supposed to be at a political meeting in Tacoma that weekend. Asked what he was doing, Ted had responded, Just walking around. They had invited him to join them skiing, but he demurred because he had no shorts with him. Ted had had a windbreaker slung around his shoulders. They had seen no cast. On the next Sunday, the 14th, Meg, of course, had seen Ted only early in the morning and then again sometime after 6 when he came to her home to exchange the ski rack and take her out for hamburgers. My mother always keeps a diary, Meg said. My folks came up to visit me on May 23rd. 1974. On Memorial Day, the 27th, Ted went with us for a picnic on Dungness Spit. What about May 31st? Kathy McChesney asked. That was the night Brenda Ball had vanished from the Flame Tavern. That was the night before my daughter was to be baptized. My parents were still in Seattle, and Ted took us all out for pizza, then dropped us off before nine. Brenda had disappeared sometime after 2 a.m., 12 miles south of Meg's apartment five hours later. 
Leanne had been baptized at 5 p.m. the next day, and Ted had arrived to attend the ceremony. Afterward, he stayed at Meg's place until 11 p.m. He was so very tired. He fell asleep on the rug that night, too, she told McChesney. Meg furnished the name of a woman that Ted had dated during the summer of 1972, a woman who had caused her to break up with her lover briefly. This woman, Claire Forrest, was slender, brunette, with her long, straight hair parted in the middle. When she was contacted by detectives, Claire Forrest remembered Ted well. Although she had never been seriously interested in him, she said that they had dated often in 1972. He didn't feel that he fit in with my... my class. I guess that's the only way to describe it. He wouldn't come to my parents' home because he said he just didn't fit in. Claire recalled that she had once taken a drive with Ted, a drive over country roads in the Lake Sammamish area. He told me that someone, an older woman, I think he said it was his grandmother, lived around there, but he couldn't find the house. I finally got fed up with it and asked him what the address was, but he didn't know. Ted, of course, had no grandmother near Lake Sammamish. Claire Forrest said that she had had intercourse with Bundy only on one occasion, and although he had always been tender and affectionate with her before, the sex act itself had been harsh. We went on a picnic in April on the Hump Tulips River, and I had quite a lot of wine. I was dizzy, and he kept dunking my head under. He was trying to untie the top of my bikini, he couldn't manage it, and he suddenly pulled my bikini bottom off and had intercourse with me. He didn't say anything, and he had his forearm pressed under my chin so hard that I, I couldn't breathe. I kept telling him I couldn't breathe, but he didn't let up the pressure until he was finished. There was just no affection at all. Afterward... It was like it never happened. We drove home, and he talked about his family. Everyone but his father. I broke up with him because of his other girlfriend. She was almost hysterical when she found me with him once. Claire Forrest was not the only woman who would recall that Ted Bundy's manner could change suddenly from one of warmth and affection to cold fury. On June 23, 1974, Ted had shown up to the home of a young woman, a woman who had known him on a platonic basis since 1973. She introduced him to a friend of hers, Lisa Temple. Ted didn't seem particularly interested in Lisa, but later he invited the two women and another male friend to go on a raft trip with him on June 29th. The couples had dinner with friends in Bellevue on June 28th, spent the night, and set out the next morning for Thrope, Washington. The man who accompanied them was later to recall that, while searching for matches, he had found a pair of pantyhose in the glove box of Ted's Volkswagen. He had grinned and thought nothing of it. The raft trip had started out with great hilarity, but halfway down the river, Ted's attitude had changed suddenly, and he seemed to delight in tormenting Lisa. He insisted that she ride through the white water on an inner tube tied behind the raft, Lisa had been terrified, but Ted had only stared at her coldly. The other couple were ill at ease, too. Ted had put the raft into the water at Deverson Dam, a dangerous stretch where rafts were rarely launched. They had made it, finally, through the rough water, with both girls thoroughly frightened. Ted had had no money, so Lisa bought dinner in North Bend for the quartet. He drove me home, she remembers, and he was nice again. He said he would be back about midnight. He did come back, and we made love. That's the last time I ever saw him. I just couldn't understand the way he kept changing. One minute he was nice, and then the next he acted like he hated me. Kathy McChesney located Patrice Salone, the elderly woman who befriended Ted when he worked at a Seattle yacht club. Oh, he was a schemer, the old woman recalled. He could talk me out of anything. 
Mrs. Sloan's recollections of Ted and Stephanie corresponded with what Kathy had already learned about that early romance. There was no question that the woman had known Ted and known him quite well. Kathy drove her around the university district and she pointed out addresses where Ted had lived when she knew him. She recounted the things she'd loaned him, the china, silver, money. She recalled rides she'd given him when he had no car. He seemed to be like a grandson to her, a highly manipulative grandson. When was the last time you saw him? McChesney asked. Well, I saw him twice, actually, in 1974. I saw him in the Albertson store at Green Lake in July, and he had a broken arm then. Then I saw him on the Ave about a month later. He told me he was leaving soon to go to law school in Salt Lake City. The King County detectives contacted Stephanie Brooks, happily married now and living in California. She recalled her two romances with Ted Bundy, their college days and their engagement in 1973. She had never known about Meg Anders. She had simply come to the conclusion that Ted had courted her a second time solely to get revenge. She felt lucky to be free of him. There seemed to be two Ted Bundys merging. One, the perfect son, the University of Washington student who had graduated with distinction, the fledgling lawyer and politician. And the other, a charming schemer, a man who could manipulate women with ease, whether it be sex or money he desired. It made no difference if the women were 18 or 65. And there was, perhaps, a third Ted Bundy, a man who turned cold and hostile towards women with very little provocation. He had juggled his concurrent engagements with Meg and Stephanie so skillfully that neither of them knew of each other's existence. Now it seems that he had lost them both. Stephanie was married, and Meg declared that she no longer wanted to marry Ted. She was deathly afraid of him. Yet, within a matter of weeks, she would take him back and blame herself for ever doubting him. As far as women went, Ted always had a backup. Even as he sat in Salt Lake County Jail, unaware that Meg had talked so volubly about him to detectives, he had the emotional support of Sharon Auer. Sharon seemed to have fallen in love with him. I would soon realize that it was not prudent to mention Sharon's name to Meg or to speak of Meg to Sharon. It is interesting to note that through all the trials, throughout all the years of black headlines that would label Ted a monster, and worse, he would always have at least one woman entranced with him, living for the few moments she could visit him in jail, running errands for him, proclaiming his innocence. The women would change as time passed. Apparently, the emotions he provoked in them would not. Ted had his distractors as he languished in jail in Salt Lake City during the fall of 1975. But he had his staunch supporters, too. One of them was Alan Scott, the cousin he'd grown up with since he moved to Tacoma when he was four years old. Scott, himself a teacher of disturbed youngsters, insisted that he had never detected the slightest signs of deviant behavior in Ted. He, his sister Jane, and Ted had always been close, closer than Ted had ever been with his half-brothers and sisters. His cousins were not Bundys, and Ted had never really felt part of the Bundy clan. It is ironic then that Jane and Alan Scott would prove to be further links in the chain of circumstantial evidence tying Ted to the missing Washington girls. They did not serve as links willingly. Indeed, they did believe in his innocence completely. They worked to solicit funds for Ted's defense, and many of his old friends contributed. Dr. Patricia Lundborg of the psychology department at the University of Washington stated flatly that Ted Bundy could not possibly be a killer and said that there was absolutely no reason to believe that he had ever known Linda Ann Healy despite the fact that he had both taken abnormal psychology, Psych 499, in the winter and spring quarters of 1972. There are hundreds of students in many different sections of 499, she said scornfully. There's no way to prove that they were in the same sections. Lundborg said she intended to do everything she could to support Bundy against the ridiculous charges and innuendos about him. But there was another link between Bundy and Linda Ann Healy, and that link was through his cousin Jane. Linda had lived in McMone Hall. Her roommate was the woman who would later be Jane Scott's roommate. 
Detective Bob Keppel located Jane on a fishing boat in Alaska and interviewed her in a phone call to Dutch Harbor. Jane was not a willing witness. She too said her cousin had been normal, kind, not the kind of boy or man who would kill. She had seen him, she said, three or four times during the first half of 1974. Jane had met Linda Healy. She could never recall that Ted had. Yes, there had been some parties over the years, but she didn't know for sure Ted had ever attended the same parties that Linda had. Did you ever speak of Linda's disappearance to Ted? Keppel asked. Yeah, she said reluctantly. But I can't remember anything specific. We just talked about what a terrible thing it was. Alan Scott was even less cooperative, an understandable position. Alan had lived at Frida Rogers' home from September 1971 to February 1972. He and Ted had remained in close contact, and Alan had talked to Ted within days of the disappearances of Roberta Barks, Brenda Ball, George Ann Hawkins, Denise Nesland, and Janice Ott. He was relaxed, happy, excited about going to law school in Utah, and looked forward to marrying Meg. Scott didn't add that a man had abducted and killed young women, couldn't have acted so calm, but that was his implication. Scott had gone sailing with his cousin on Lake Washington, and they often hiked together. Where? Keppel asked. In the Carbonado area, and off Highway 18 or North Bend. Taylor Mountain, the resting place of the four of Washington victims' skulls, was off Highway 18 near North Bend. Keppel said quietly, When did you hike up there? July 1972 through the summer of 1973. Scott did not want to show the King County detectives just where they had hiked. He was reluctant to incriminate his cousin, and in the end it would take the threat of a subpoena to make him lead them over the trails that had become familiar to Bundy. On November 26, 1975, a subpoena was served on Alan Scott, and he accompanied Bob Keppel to the area where he had hiked with Ted. They drove towards Taylor Mountain, and Scott pointed out rough fields and woods along the Fall City, Duval Road, the Esquah Hobart Road. Ted knew the roads around here, and we drove around in my car, looking at old farms and barns. There was one place with a great footage along the Fall City Preston Road. That's the only time we really got out and hiked. He pointed out to the road, three quarters of a mile north of Preston. We hiked about two hours up that hillside. The area was only a few miles from Taylor Mountain. Apparently, the region between Issaquah and North Bend had been a favorite haunt of Ted's. He had driven Meg there and Claire Forrest, mentioned it to his elderly woman friend, and taken his cousin there. He had gone to Lake Sammamish State Park, alone, only a week before July 14th. Was it merely a coincidence, or was it meaningful to the investigation? Contrary to published reports, there were some eyewitness identifications of Ted Bundy. One witness was contaminated, however, by the zeal of a newswoman. When Ted was arrested in the Durant kidnapping case, the television reporter rushed to the home of one of the women who had been approached by the stranger at Lake Sammamish on July 14th. The anchor woman held out a photo of Ted Bundy and asked, Is this the man who asked you to help him? The woman could not identify him. The man in the picture shown to her looked older than the handsome, tanned man she had seen. When King County detectives later shown her a mug laydown of eight pictures, including one of Ted Bundy, she admitted that it was too late. She had already been shown a picture and now she was confused. It was a major blow to the investigation. The tearing hurry of the news media to show Ted to the public continued to get in the way of the probe. Two other women who had seen the Ted at the park recognized him at once, but they recognized him from the pictures they had seen in the paper and on television. They were convinced that Ted Bundy and the other Ted were one and the same. But any defense lawyer would contend that they had been subconsciously swayed by glimpsing Ted's picture in the media. A male witness who was present at Lake Sammamish on July 14th was out of the state when the news of the Utah arrest broke, and he'd seen no pictures of Ted at all, yet he picked Ted Bundy's picture from a mug laid down without hesitation. So did the Oregon District Attorney's son, who had been in Ellensburg on April 17th, when Susan Rancourt vanished. He was 70% sure. 
far from being as valuable in court as 100% would have been. I drove back to Seattle from Ellensburg late that night, he recalled. When I was about 10 miles east of Isqua, I noticed a small foreign car pulled off on a side road. The taillights were small and round, like a VW's. The spot he mentioned was close to Taylor Mountain. Another tiny link? For a fiction writer, it would have been enough. For an actual criminal investigation, it was circumstantial evidence. Block upon block piled up until there was no doubt in the Washington detective's minds that Theodore Robert Bundy was the Ted they had sought for so long. But enough to bring charges? No. They didn't have so much as a single hair, a button, or an earring. Nothing that locked Ted Bundy tightly to any of the victims. No prosecutor in his right mind would touch it. They would count over 40 coincidences, and even taken all together, they weren't enough. The final coincidence was a case that Seattle Morals Detective Joyce Johnson had investigated, a rape case that occurred on March 2, 1974, at 4220 12th Avenue and E, only a few houses from Frida Rogers' rooming house. The victim, an attractive 20-year-old woman, had gone to bed around 1 a.m. on that Saturday morning. My shades were drawn, but there's a place where one of the curtains doesn't meet the sill, and someone could look in and see that I was alone. About three quarters of the time, I have someone with me. That morning, I'd forgotten to put the wooden slate in the window to lock it. The man took off the screen, and then I woke up about four... I saw him standing in the doorway. I saw his profile. There was a light shining through from the living room where he had left his flashlight on. He came over and sat on my bed and told me to relax, that he wouldn't hurt me. The woman had asked him how he'd gotten in, and he answered, It's none of your business. The man had worn a t-shirt, jeans, and had a dark navy watch cap pulled over his face to below his chin. It wasn't a ski mask, but I think he had made slits in it for his eyes because he could see. His voice was well educated. He'd been drinking. I could smell it. He had a knife with a carved handle, but he said he wouldn't use it if I didn't fight. The man had taped her eyes, and then had raped her. She didn't fight him. When he was finished, he taped her hands and feet, telling her it was just to slow her down. She heard him go into the living room and crawl through a window, then heard the sounds of footsteps running through the alley. She heard no car. She told Detective Johnson, He was so calm and sure of himself. I think he's done it before. The Seattle police detectives and Captain Nick Mackey and his detectives Bob Keppel Roger Dunn, Kathy McChesney, were convinced that they had found Ted. They listed the tie-ins with the missing girls' cases. Ted Bundy matched the physical description, so much that four people had connected him to the composite drawing of the man seen at Lake Sammamish. He often wore white tennis outfits. He had lived within a mile of Linda Ann Healy, George Ann Hawkins, and Joni Lenz. He drove a light tans Volkswagen. He often affected a British accent. He played racquetball. He had had a knife, a cleaver, a taped wrench, a crowbar, a hatchet, crutches, plaster of Paris, surgical gloves, and an unexplained woman's clothing in his possession. His whereabouts on the vital days could not be accounted for. He had missed work for three days before and two days after the Lake Sammamish disappearances. He regularly traveled I-5 between Seattle and Olympia. He had had a friend in the Evergreen State Campus and often stayed with him. He had had a friend in Ellensburg, a friend who recalled Ted's visiting in the spring of 1974. He had pantyhose in the glove compartment of his car. His cousin knew Linda Healy, and he had taken the same class as Linda had. He had been seen at Lake Sammamish State Park a week before Janice and Denise vanished. He had hiked in Taylor Mountain area. He liked to sneak up behind women. He liked to frighten women. He preferred women with long, dark hair, parted in the middle. He had tried to choke at least two women while making love to them. He frequented Dante's Tavern, the tavern Linta had gone to the night she had vanished. His manner towards women had changed in an instant, from tenderness to hostility. 
He had often worn a false mustache. He liked to sail, had rented sailboats. In the Colorado cases, his credit cards had been used in the same areas and towns on the same days the women vanished. He had lied, and he had stolen. He appeared to be fascinated with bondage and sodomy. He had been arrested with a ski mask, pantyhose mask, handcuffs, gloves, garbage bags, strips of cloth, and a crowbar in his possession. He'd reported his license plates missing in Utah, but kept them and used them interchangeably with the new plates issued to him. His blood type was O, the type found on the kidnapped victim Carol Duranch's coat. He had been identified by Duranch, Graham, Beck, the young man in Ellensburg, and by three witnesses at Lake Sammamish State Park on July 14th. He had been seen by his elderly benefactress in July 1974 with his arm in a cast. During 1974, he'd slept during the days and was gone, somewhere, late at night. A woman was raped by a man answering his description only three doors from the Rogers' rooming house. One of his high school friends was acquainted with George Ann Hawkins' family. He was intelligent, charming, and could approach women easily and successfully. He habitually wore corduroy trousers, the ribbed pattern in the blood of Linda Healy's bed. The list went on and on, and the investigators always came back to the fact that wherever Ted Bundy went, there was soon a lovely young woman, or two, or three, missing. On the other hand, there were dozens of people who were willing to swear that Ted Bundy was a perfect citizen, a man who worked to wipe out violence, to bring about order and peace through the system, that Ted Bundy was a lover, not a destroyer, of mankind. If he was what detectives believed, a mass killer, he had been cast from an entirely new mold. On November 13, 1975, while Ted remained in the Salt Lake County Jail and his friends and relatives sought to raise the 15000 needed to bail him out, what came to be known as the Aspen Summit Meeting was held. Mackey, Keppel, and Dunn were there, as were Jerry Thompson and Ira Beal from Utah, Mike Fisher from Aspen, and dozens of other detectives who had unsolved cases of missing and murdered girls. Inside the Holiday Inn, the details of all of those investigations were exchanged, and the name Theodore Robert Bundy was heard often. A tremendous amount of information was exchanged, only making each department involved more certain that they now had their killer in jail. In jail, but with not enough physical evidence to bring further charges. Newspapers were full of suppositions, but new facts. If the mysterious unknown Ted had frustrated them before, the known Ted Bundy still eluded them. On November 20th, Ted was freed on bail, 15000 raised by Johnny and Louise Bundy. When and if he returned to face trial and the kidnapping charges involved Carol DeRanch, that money would be returned and then given to John O'Connell to pay for Ted's defense. In Seattle, Meg Anders was so frightened of her ex-lover that she made detectives promise that she would be notified the minute he crossed into the state of Washington. It is indicative of his persuasive powers to note that, within a day or so of his return to Washington, he was back with her, living in her apartment. All her doubts had been erased, and she was completely in love with him again. She did not deny published reports that they were engaged to be married. She berated herself for having betrayed him and would, for years, stand by him. Ted was free, but not truly free. Wherever he went, he was under constant surveillance by officers recruited from both the King County and Seattle Police Departments. Mackie explained it to me. We can't charge him, but we can't risk letting him out of our sight. If anything should happen while he's up here, if another girl should disappear, they'll be held to pay. And so, from the moment Ted's plane landed at Seattle Tacoma Airport, he was tailed. He seemed at first to ignore the sneaker cars that followed him as he spent his days with Meg and her daughter or stayed in a friend's apartment. I didn't know if I'd hear from Ted when he was in Seattle, but several detectives took me aside and said, If he calls you, we don't want you going anywhere alone with him, not unless you tell us where you're going to be first. Oh, come on, I said. I'm not afraid of Ted. Besides, you're following him every place anyway. If I'm with him, you'll see me. Just be careful, a Seattle homicide detective warned. Maybe we'd better know where to find your dental records in case we need to identify you. I laughed, but the words were jarring. 
the black humor that would surround Ted Bundy evermore had begun.